Um, so um, I'd like to welcome to Politics and Prose Live, uh, Jennifer McCombie, and she will be in conversation with Lily King. Um, <clears throat> Jennifer is an international award-winning author, um, and she prevents, presents her sweeping and powerful portrait of a young girl and her family. In her 12th year, Sharabo, a young Ugandan girl, confronts a piercing question that has haunted her since childhood. Who is my mother? Complicating her feelings of abandonment, as Chirabo comes of age, she feels the emergence of a mysterious second self, a headstrong and confusing force inside her at odds with her sweet and obedient nature. Seeking answers, Chirabo spend, begins spending afternoons with Suta, a local witch, trading stories and learning not only about this force inside her, but about the woman who birthed her, who she learns is alive, but she is not ready to meet. A girl is a body of water is the sweeping testament to the true and lasting connections between history, tradition, family, friends, and the promise of a different future. Um, as I previously mentioned, Ms. McCombie is in conversation tonight with Lily King, who herself is an award-winning author, um, has comprised five novels, with the most recent being Writers and Lovers. And without further ado, it is all yours, ladies. Mm -hmm. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Lily. So nice to see you. Lovely to see you too. Thank you for hosting me. Oh, and thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Politics and Prose as well, for making this possible. I, as you know, I loved this book so, so much. I loved it. You have to see my copy. This is my copy. I, I haven't even my seen days. the finished <laughs> version. Um, but uh, I know, look at the back and the front and everything. Oh, wow. So, such a pleasure. You all are in for such a treat with this book. Um, I really love the way you're just taking on these really huge themes like Ugandan mythology and, you know, uh, the role of women in a patriarchy, but also really telling such a, a an intimate and compelling story of a family. Um, and I, I wondered, I, I'm going to have you read in a little bit, um, yeah. if you don't mind, but I thought, I thought maybe we would just start with, you know, our heroine, Shirabu. Yes. Shirabu, is that, am I doing that? Yes. I'm slightly right. Um, and, and so the first page, you know, she's 12 years old and she wants to tell a story to her um, teenage relatives who are all in the house and not paying much attention to her. And she says, once a day came and she, she waits for them to respond because she has to have permission to tell this story, um, yeah. which I thought was just so, such an interesting, you know, way to kind of plunge us into this world. And she waits and of course they don't give her permission so she can't tell the story. And, um, and it kind of sets up, you know, obviously this story. And, um, and the story, you know, that, that evolves from her life as we follow her for so many years. And I'm wondering, have you, have you always liked to tell stories? And did you have an audience when you were younger for, for your stories? Uh, thank you. Thank you for that, Lily. Uh, indeed, um, like Chiravo, I also started telling stories orally you know, traditional folk stories that were told to me by my grandparents. And I, I lived uh, uh, in the city, but I would have holidays in the village with my grandfather. And over there in the evening, we would tell stories. Mm -hmm. And so you would have to ask for permission to tell your story. And not all the time did the older people want to listen to your stories and besides as a young person your stories are patchy and you're just putting learning to put them together so often they didn't have enough you know time for me or my other cousins that um were there but um a later and i think this is what prepared me for writing because later in when i was in the city my father was all into books so he as a child he bought me you know we had those ladybird keywords book did you ever see them no uh, the, i think they were mainly british based 
and mm -hmm. so uh, I I got the um, fairy tales. <laughs> so I grew up reading Cinderella, uh, Rapunzel, and all of them. So I would go to the village and translate <laughs> those stories into Luganda, and I would have them to look for equivalent. But because not everything European translated into African. So if I was doing Cinderella, uh, the, 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 you know, she would be such a good dancer. She would dance all the other girls off the floor. Uh, but uh, things like the um, pumpkin and the rat turning into things, that translated beautiful. So uh, yes, I used to tell stories as, as a child at that level. But unlike Chilabo, I didn't leave with my grandparents. I would then go back to the city. Uh-huh. Oh, that's so, so interesting. And um, w did you feel like you, to, when you started writing um, did, professionally, did you feel like there was somebody that, that you had to get permission from? Was it from yourself or from, you know, w was there anything like that? Oh, Lily, that is so funny because <laughs> when I was writing, I remember when I was write, rewriting that opening part again, mm. and my first novel had been rejected and rejected and rejected. So I wrote it. Then at that point, I came back to this book. I was like, oh my God, the gatekeepers are just like the anchors and aunts. <laughs> it's so you know, funny. It just crossed my mind that um, um, I, I'm, I'm surprised that you have picked up on it. Because I remember writing with like, yeah, yeah, you know, you can escape your uncles and aunties, but, you know, there will always be someone stopping exactly. you from right, telling your story. Wow. And, and it's so interesting because I did read that you started this novel in 1998. And then... Yes. And, so can you tell it, can you... I'm, I always want to know, like, what was the initial moment of spark of an idea, you know, and what was your vision of it? And then all these years later, and I imagine many versions and revisions and maybe complete overhauls later, you have, you know, the book we're seeing today. And can you just tell, talk a little bit about that kind of evolution? Well, I started in 98 and I had just got a new job um, and I was an English teacher, taught English and literature in Uganda and the headmaster was British and he, he had just moved into uh, um, the village where I lived and he was surprised by the kind of life Africans around him were living. I don't know where he had been, but he told me that actually uh, people in Britain imagine that Africans don't wake up in the morning to go to work, they just sit and wait for aid. And it, it, he said, oh my God, people working, everybody's busy, you know, no one is waiting for aid. And it didn't make sense to me while I was in Uganda, but he kept on saying, you need to write, you need to write and tell the world that Africans are working hard. And so, I started writing, but as yeah. you can imagine, write what? Write which Africa and to who? You know, but then yeah. I immediately created Chiravo, you know, and I quickly found out that I could not write Africa and that Africa did not need me to write it, you know. <laughs> if people misunderstand it, that's their problem. So I put that aside and carried on with, uh, with Chiravo. But um, I think I wrote the first time for two weeks, nonstop. Um, I was writing with a pencil and I got a blister on my, oh my God. one of my fingers. Oh yeah, I was so into it. But when I finished the, um, the in, after the two weeks, I read through and it was utter drivel. <laughs> <laughs> Were you really, are you sure you knew that was to be true? I don't know. I read through it and I thought, who would read this? I, I literally threw it under the bed. And it stayed there for a very long time. And a friend then wanted to improve her uh, keyboard skills. Uh, we were, at that time, we were using floppies. 
Oh. And, and she said, I know you are writing a book. Can you give it to me? So she started putting it on a floppy. And when she finished, she came back and said, oh, I loved it. Could you write some more for me? Wow. <laughs> I know. And I, I wrote some more. But she, unfortunately, one time we were talking about literature. And I asked her which was her favorite book. And she said, and more farm. Uh, and she she said, oh, but it's that book about the French Revolution, you know, Napoleon. And I thought, okay. She said, my <laughs> book is good. I don't think so. I threw it away after that. And I didn't come back to it until 2001 when she actually came to Britain to study for her master's degree wow. and found out that there were creative writing courses so she went to the university and said, I know this great writer in Uganda, God help her. Uh, and she said, I would like her to enroll. And I think she enrolled me three years consecutively and I would say, yeah, I'm coming and, and I just throw it away. In the end, um, the lecturer interviewed me on the phone and said, can you send me a copy of your writing? So I sent him a copy and he said, okay, I would like you to come. So that's how I came to Britain and I wrote the first uh, version of it. I finished it in 2003. And I remember my supervisor saying, this is fantastic. This is great. So I sent it out expecting, you know, everybody to go, hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, it was rejected and rejected left, right and center. And it was so disheartening. So I rewrote it um, from 2003 to 2005, sent it out again. And again, it was rejected. Rewrote it between 2005 and 2008, sent it out and it was rejected. And at that point, I said, okay, I put it away because I had started writing Chintu. So I completed Chintu, which got published, and then came back to this. Wow. And when I you know. came back to it, did you change it completely or did you just play with it a little bit? I just played with it a little bit. I didn't, uh, the characters remained the same. Perhaps I removed a book. Um, Jirabo's mother also had a book about her oh that's interesting i know that's interesting that's why i removed I that. that i want to <laughs> read that <laughs> you might have to send that to me i i will send that to you lily i i need that all of that information um, oh my god and you're such a generous reader i'm gonna send it to you okay thank you um tell me that friend she's like a fairy godmother that friend oh she is she's fantastic because when i arrived in britain i had no idea what to do i i didn't even bring warm clothing and i arrived <laughs> i know i arrived in in september and uh, she shared everything she had with me i slept in her bed i i, I would go to a uni Dress like you know the Michelin man, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yes. and the lecturer would say, "Jenny, you can take off your jacket." And I said, "No, I don't think so." <laughs> <laughs> and you've been there eighteen years now. Yes, I've been here eighteen years. Can you believe it? I can't. I can't. You didn't. You didn't plan that. No, I didn't. I thought that I would come and publish probably two, three books, mm. get rich go back home, buy a big house, a car, and live the life of a celebrity. <laughs> well, you're getting there. I'm still here in a very <laughs> tiny flat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, all right. Before we, before we hear a little bit of the book, I just, the, the whole idea of storytelling, you know, comes back through and back through. And there's one time kind of in the middle of the book um, where I think it's Suta who says, maybe storytelling killed the pain. And do you feel like there's some truth to that, 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 um, that storytelling can kill the pain? Yes. I, I don't know whether it kills, but it moves the mind away from the pain. Yeah. 
I know that in my life, there are certain things that have happened and I've created alternative stories. Mm -hmm. And, I, I, you know, it's until I go home and I sit down with my siblings and we talk about things and they say, Jennifer, what are you talking about? <laughs> Where did that come from? This is actually what happened. And I've now realized that, uh, you know what, if I can't handle the truth, I always come up with my alternative truth. So uh, for me, that is storytelling. That's me changing the story and telling myself a different one. And that's the way to handle pain. That's so interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really get that. I feel the same way. Um, okay, should we hear a few um, a few pages or paragraphs or whatever you'd like to read? Yes, uh, I'll read the very first section uh, 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 at the opening. So, okay. until that night, Chirabo had not cared about her. She was curious on occasion, where is she? What does she look like? How does it feel to have a mother? That sort of thing. But whenever she asked about her and family said, no one knows about her, in that never mind way of large families, she dropped it. After all, she was with family and she was loved. But then recently, her second self, the one who did mad things, had started to fly out of her body and she had linked the two. On this occasion, when she asked about her mother and family fobbed her off again with, oh, don't think about her. Think about your grandparents and your father, something tall. It must have been the new suspicion. Maybe she does not want me because I am that cut like razors. Very nice. Thank you so much. Um, so the novel is, um, broken into three books. Is that right? You have, you have Chirabo and then you have, um, you have, um, Suta and Alixa. And, um, and it's really funny because I thought we were going to follow Chirabo straight through and I was just yes. all in with her. And then suddenly there's this shock where you have where you have that's how I felt about it at the time like I have to go back to 1934 and leave Tirabu behind and yeah. um and and I was like really I remember saying to my daughter as I was reading I'm like no I can't do this and then I instantly got into it and of course then I didn't want to leave and when that section ended I was like no <laughs> because I got so into that story and um, and so so really in some ways they're kind of two pairs of women who are pitted against each other because of yes. a man um, yeah. in different generations uh, and and the relationships are just so complex and so fascinating. Um, I don't really have a question there. I just wanted to say how good it was, <laughs> and I also just wanted to say a few just a couple of moments that I just. These aren't questions either, I'm afraid, but um, I loved it when Suta says, sometimes God loved her as if he'd never killed her. <laughs> that was just, I, I, you know, she is just such an amazing character. I will listen to everything that she has to say. She's so, um, she's so strong and she's so wise. Um, and then I love that moment with Jibwa and Chirobu, Chirobu when, um, when Jibwa, discovers her her one breast is developing you know before the other and yes you know they're 12 years old and and she shows her you know uh she shows her friend her her left breast that's developing and and um Chirubu wants to touch it but but um Jibwa says you know your breasts are shy and they could go back and and uh it's just this really really wonderful moment of childhood you know um, that, and the intimacy of their friendship. Uh, yes. And also it just really shows you what each girl is about. And, you know, yes. I, I, it defines their character in such a beautiful, natural way, you know, where you're not, you're not like shouting it at us, you know, you're just letting us, us see that. And I, I, I just, um, there's so many moments like that. Um, 
And then, of course, there's this there's this moment. I really really will let you speak now. But <laughs> when Suda Sashirbo, you fly out of your body because our original state is in you. You know, you mentioned that she has this ability to kind of fly out of her body when she feels squeezed. You know, yes. when things just get too um, tense. And I, I wonder if you can explain a little bit about that and how that relates to, you know, mythology about women and, um, and kind of um, Chirbo's journey in this book. Um, the, the, the whole idea of flying, um, Chirbo, whenever she's, um, so the first time we see her fly is when she's, um, the uncles have said something really nasty about her and, and she flies out of the body because it's the body that that uh, attra brings all this pain to her and, mm -hmm. and she leaves it behind you know and um and, and suta you later find out that she's perhaps a little too clever and this is what why perhaps she's been called a witch because yeah. clever women have always been called witches yeah. it doesn't matter which culture they come from the women are not supposed to be that intelligent that clever and so to uh, deter other women from being like that they are you know called witches but despite her being a witch she attracts trouble to to herself mm -hmm. and in, in Suta when she sees the little girl she sees something she recognizes and she says I can nurture this I can in fact she thought that uh, a rebel had just landed in her house mm -hmm. and all she had to do was to prepare her give her um, the traditional knowledge about feminism and then let her go out and break all the rules and you know and so uh, once she, when she found out the travel flies, then she finds a story to explain the flight. Mm -hmm. And she says to her, it's a good thing. You are very happy. You're at peace when you fly. And she says, yeah, I saw you flying the other night. Uh -huh. But, <laughs> you know, but at the same time, what Nsuta is doing is creating myths. Because remember, most of the myth about women have been created about us. Mm -hmm. We haven't created our own myth. So Suta is replacing those myths and giving the girl a myth that is created by a woman that she knows is going to help her. Mm -hmm. So th th this is where all that is coming from. But it's, it's also all linked or steeped in a culture that has those kinds of stories. So that when Suta tells Chirabu some stories or some myth, she can ask her, can you tell me this? Do you understand that? Have you ever heard of this one? Because um, it's very important that they are all linked mm -hmm. to the culture that is familiar to both of them. Mm -hmm. And Chirabu really drinks it in. And she, oh, she does. She will, and she just she's exactly the right audience, right, for those stories. She's she just she needs it. It's so it's, so interesting, and 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 it's really a way for her not to have her spirit broken. Like it seems like, you know, she doesn't want her to be scared of that person who flies, you know, because that is her her spirit, and you know, her the life inside her. Um, so I have a question about you. You mentioned a number of times in this, in this novel without going into, you know, a long explanation that would pull us out of the, um, the story itself, but I'm not going to get, I'm not going to pronounce this right, but, um, when can I'm can Yeah, when can I'm can Okay, thank you. You got it right. <laughs> tell me, tell me uh, the meaning of that word, its history, and, and how it differs from Western notions of feminism. Okay. Mwenkanonkano, um, Mwenkanonkano, you know, that, that repetition is about the, the um, e equality, you know, the Mwenkanonkano, you know, um, having um like uh, 
I'm trying to use um, a metaphor that perhaps is not you're not familiar mm. to, mm. but you remember when Chirabo goes to collect to buy salt? Yes. Yes, and yes. it's put on uh, scales. Mm -hmm. You know that uh, the scale does, you yeah. know, coming and that's when kind of, kind of equality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's yeah. what that word means. Yes. So, um, and it's, it's, that's what we call feminism in Uganda. Mm. For us, feminism is just about equality. We yeah. don't go into theories or whatever, anything else. We are about women and men um, being perceived in culture and by country and by everyone as equal. Mm -hmm. But, um, however, wherever women have been oppressed, of course, there have been ideas of feminism. It's just that they didn't have the word feminism. Mm -hmm. Often they didn't have a movement. Mm -hmm. But w women, especially in cultures of ours, where you have polygamy, you would have women sitting together and discussing their husband mm -hmm. and laughing. Mm -hmm. or, or when women came together, they would talk about their husbands and they would laugh. And one of the things that tended to come back um, among women was always women, men are children. You just have to treat them as such because they are so delicate, mm -hmm. you know. So the, they've always been these ideas. And, and I, was, I was interested in the fact that, you know, most women every day, when they wake up, it's a, it's a, a battle of feminism, but they don't think about it. It's life, you know. You go out, you negotiate, you push. Sometimes you pull back and, and, and compromise. Then when it's safe, you push forward. Mm -hmm. To me, that is feminism. This idea of a movement is, is new. But mm -hmm. this is what our grandmothers and our mothers and our greats and all those women bef before us have been doing. They have been pushing and mm -hmm. pushing forward. And mm -hmm. then when it doesn't work, they step for backward and apologize. And when we, they feel the time is right, they push, you know, forward. And for me, I wanted to bring that to the fore, that this, is, this was going on in Africa before yeah. feminism arrived. And that's what I call Mwenkanonkan. That's really interesting. Um, I won't reveal who, but uh, in the novel, kind of, you know, toward the end, um, a, a young patriarch dies. And, mm -hmm. um, and it's, such, it's, it's so interesting because um, the patriarchy has to be addressed directly by the women and by the men and what's going to happen and who's going to get what. And suddenly all these, these notions, you know, aren't theoretical anymore. It's like, Oh yeah. You know, the, the, the daughter of the patriarch will not get the house kind of thing. And, and, yes. um, and that her children will not inherit that. It will all, you know, go back and, and people are, and the women, are pushing against it, you know, and it seems like they they they're taking a step forward, you know, they're 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 pushing and they're they have a little bit of success, and and I wonder, um, uh, is that what you witnessed when you when you were growing up, and ha has there have there been more steps since? Yes, um, in the seventies, it was as bad as that. But uh, there have been uh, improvement. Now, um, uh, a woman inherits her husband's um, possessions. In the past, if your husband died, his family would come for the children and from, for his property. And the wife would have to go and look for another husband, that sort of thing. Right, right. So that has improved. And of course, women can own property now they can buy their own land and but in the past you wouldn't inherit 
your father's land mm -hmm. because you wouldn't pass it on. So when my dad died, um, which was only recently in 2010, 2011, mm -hmm. and luckily I'm the eldest, so I just went home like, whoo, <laughs> this, <laughs> this is what we're going to do. We're going to um, uh, divide the land equally and everybody's going to get, and even my siblings who had died, their children would inherit what would be theirs, even though they were girls. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it has improved. But what cannot be done is a girl being an heir, you know, the successor. That is, it's, 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 we pushed and we pushed mm -hmm. in reality. And it's a wall. It's still such a patriarchal world. But yes, things have improved. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's so interesting because you examine it very briefly and perhaps more in your previous novel um, about the first man. Mm -hmm. um, but Sio, uh, he, he expresses just in a, in a conversation that they're having together, this is um, Tirabo's love interest, uh, that, um, that the patriarchy can be really can be very difficult for a man to navigate and that there are certain pressures on him. And he, he, kinda, he tells her that uh, he feels all this pressure when he's with a woman to come on to her, you know, yes. to, to show her that he desires her. Otherwise, she'll may perhaps tell somebody that, oh, you know, he's not very manly. And, uh, yeah. and, he, and you know, and there's this, there's this notion that privilege, and, and another leather line that you had later on was, you know, privilege can be oppressive too. And I, can you speak about that a little bit? Because it's, it's not something you hear very often. Well, yeah. Um, I, yes, as you said, Lily, I, I, I started talking about the oppression of masculinities within the patriarchy um, in, the, in the first novel. And, mm -hmm. and I, I, because I knew this novel was coming, you know, and it's uh, very... Yeah. Yeah. very feminist you, and you, you guys were not going to give up on that novel you knew it was going to come is that right oh yeah <laughs> you that's so incredible it's really I, I knew this novel was coming and i know in uganda feminism is not very popular and i thought okay as a feminist let me start where uh, masculinities are also oppressed within the patriarchy and, and, and I looked at how our culture does not allow men to go into the kitchen. And therefore, when a man marries a woman who doesn't know how to cook, then he eats bad food for the rest of his life. Not that I'm complaining. <laughs> but uh, there are ways that um, ma they perform masculinity. It's, it, it's ridiculous. This idea of... Um, a hypersexuality is a performance. This idea of strength, you can't cry, it's a performance. Right. Remember when her grandfather really wants to break down and cry. And it's a woman who comes up to him and says, uh, you dare break down like a woman. <laughs> Carry on, you've got to, do you, do you know? Yes. And it's yes. such a, but it, it, it is there. And at one point, her grandfather has to hide away with his brothers in order to mourn. Right. But the, because the public cannot see him yeah. crying. So it's, it, it, it's all there, but perhaps for Seal, it is the whole idea of dating because because women say, okay, if you're going to oppress us, then you're going to buy our respect, you know, and our subservience. Right, right. You know, and so women will do anything and they perform being gentle and being unintelligent and <laughs> knowing very well what they're going to get out of men. Yeah, yeah. You know. And so Seal talks about this and says, you can't have it both ways. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't be working and want respect and want this, but I pay the bride price for you, right. you know? And when I marry you, then I have to look after your mom and dad and all of that. It's, it's just not right. So um, 
I thought that for feminism to make any headway in Africa and in Uganda in particular, we need to look at uh, these blind spots, you know, where men are oppressed and right. where women use their oppression to their advantage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you also talk about, that's reminding me of, um, of this idea of, you know, the respect that women do get, right, for being a wife and being a mother and, um, and uh, there was age and then there was another thing that they get respect for. And yes. she says at the end, you know, that is, just, that is just water that they pour on our fire, right? <laughs> have I quoted that badly? I think I quoted that badly. Wait a minute, I think I have it right here. Respect that comes with these roles is the water they pour on your fire. I thought that was oh, yeah. really, really interesting too. Oh, that's yeah. one area in which you know women can feel respected right and yes. in fact it's it's a means of tamping them down yes absolutely i mean i'm not i'm not saying just in africa it's all it's worldwide you know <laughs> it, it, it is this is why normally you find the women who are out there madly out there fighting they have to give up the marriage they have to give up motherhood and uh, and all of that because you know if you're married then you don't behave in a particular way if you've had children you don't behave in a particular way so you do something and someone says oh she's even a mother can you believe that right. oh that's somebody's right. wife can right. you believe it but if you're mad you say that's why she's not married <laughs> you know <laughs> so it's always been that women can only get so much done in terms of feminism in their 20s that once they become married and acquire the respectability remember you have to dress as a married person yeah, interesting you have to speak yeah. as a married person yeah and and oh then motherhood comes along and where, first of all, there's the time that is taken away because you're looking after children. But also, how are you going to remain, have that fire and carry on looking after children? Mm -hmm. Of course, um, sometimes even you hear children say, oh, my mom is so embarrassing, it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And you want to say, no, you will thank her when you get into your 30s and realize what she's been doing. Exactly. But this is the thing. But men can carry on doing whatever they want to do. You, they can become re revolutionaries. They can go and fight wars. Mm -hmm. They can do whatever because someone else is doing the br bringing up of children. Right. right, and, right. And, and so those uh, uh, those respectabilities are a danger. Or when people say to you, "You are a role model," you're in trouble. Right. 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 That's in there too, exactly. This yeah, idea. because you have you had coaches you. Yeah, people say, "Oh, I looked up to her." Can you imagine? You have you read that on Twitter or on you know? I, she has let me down, and I'm right. thinking, "Excuse me, go find your mother or someone else to look up to." <laughs> but but uh, I just because I've achieved this or I have done that, it doesn't mean that I'm going to curtail my life and behave in a particular way that you want and that is so against women yeah no that's so so true so true all right i'm looking at the time and i know that we're going to open it up to questions very soon so if anybody has questions they can be typing them in but there's just one other thing that i thought was that i just have to mention um so uh i, I think it's a really long quote i have to get it i'm going to quote you from an interview and that you were just so so fascinating so I read this interview um, about your first novel, Kintu, um, in which you say that African novels, that um, when they're taught in the West, the focus is always on European behaviors, you know, how Europeans destroyed the culture, sort of a, a narcissistic Western look at themselves, you know, through a, an African eye. And that, and that when, you, when you started writing novels, you knew that you wanted to, to, to look at Ugandan culture kind of separate from, from European actions and that you wanted to write for Africans and not for the West. 
And then, and then I have to read this quote to people because it's just so good. So, so she says in this interview, so we are always writing about, about Africa, not to Africa. We are always telling the world about Africa. Like Africa has asked us to explain it to the rest of the world. And when Africans read those books, they're aware that you are not writing to them. Because why would you explain their country or their culture to them? And it can be really irritating. The rest of the world doesn't know how irritating this can be because nobody has done that to them. So American culture, um, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. So American writers just write to Americans because you know the whole world understands them. So do the British. But when it comes to us, we try to explain to Americans, this is what I mean. This is what I'm doing. Because we expect that they don't understand our world. They don't understand our culture. Um, so I, I thought that it just, um, that makes so much sense to me. And I really, really love seeing it articulated like that. And um, I'm wondering if you can think about, you know, how you were doing that in this book. And, and also, I, I can't say I identified that that exactly was happening, but that I, I, I was aware the whole time um, that, you know, there, there are a couple, two ways to write a book. Um, one, the narrator says, come, look over my shoulder with me and let's, let's look at this. And then, or come, let me explain this to you, you know? And I like the come look over my shoulder and we'll go in this together and we'll just watch, you know? Yeah. And, and I just think that makes for a stronger narrative. And I think that, yes. that your philosophy ab about um, Africa and the West, you know, uh, is, is working to make it a, a much stronger narrative. So anyway. Yes, um, uh, all my writing, um, you know, uh, maybe because I started with storytelling and you always have an audience in front of you. Mm -hmm. When I'm writing, I am imagining a reader yeah. and that reader tends to be Ugandan. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes that reader is in the shape of a girl, perhaps at the back of that reader is me. Okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I, and, uh, and, and once, once I decided that that reader is me and it's Ugandan, the whole way that I write changed. That's now it. I'll give you an example. The way I talk to you, Lily, now, uh -huh. I'm sitting up straight. I'm making sure I'm not moving my hands around very much. <laughs> but if I'm talking to a Ugandan, uh -huh. I'll be doing this and... Oh my God, can you believe it? Uh, you know, that goes away um, when I'm talking to someone who's not Ugandan. It's the same with a book. Mm. If I'm writing with my mind, uh, a European person reading the book, I'd be like this right. in my book. I'll right. be straight, I'll be saying the right thing. But if I'm with a, talking to a Ugandan, there are things that I have written in this book in, in a, that uh, Europeans don't understand. Yeah. Yeah? But yeah. Uh, you know what? I love that. <laughs> and and there, there's a language that I'm using. I can write proper, straightforward English mm -hmm. because I've taught English, but it doesn't work in my novel because the story is told in my language. Mm -hmm. And if I change it into the Queen's English, sentences just fall flat on the page, moments die, characters become lifeless. So, you, you know, I just had to change everything. Yeah. But most of all, it's subject matter. What I say to Ugandans and what I say to non-Africans are different things. So mm -hmm. I'm saying, okay, everything is on the table. If you don't understand, sorry. But I have been reading books from America and from Russia and from Britain, and I've been understanding them even before I came to um, Europe. Mm -hmm. You know, we did Shakespeare, as I always point out. I did Shakespeare, uh, and I understood it even in winter, even though I'd never known what winter looks like. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, if I did... Why wouldn't Americans understand if, you know, well, and, and after doing it, 
um, I started to hear people say, yeah, it was patronizing, explaining things to us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, so curious because you, you know, you started creative, I mean, I know you started writing the novel um, back in Uganda, but then you went to the creative writing program. And I imagine that most of the people in that program were British, European, um, and so well, did you have to learn that slowly? Would, were you writing to them at first and then you sort of realized that that was happening or did you know right from the start, this is, I'm not, I'm not explaining anything to you people. <laughs> you know what I mean? um, because the book had already been written in Uganda, when I first arrived, I was writing for Africans. Mm. But then for, for some reason, I think mainly insecurities and all sorts of things. I started to twist my characters around and they started to speak proper English and they started to say things. And even the read the the they they the students in my class noticed. Because mm. I, I remember the first thing they pointed out was Oh, your male characters are not strong. Uh, I thought all African men are strong and whatever. I was like, mm, I haven't met those in my real life. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but they were criticizing everything. So I changed things. And then they noticed that the characters were dying. And they said, no, 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 please don't do that. And so I twisted it around. But I think it was not until I started to read about reception, um, the way uh, readers receive a book, the mm -hmm. fact that you can write a book, but it doesn't come alive until readers have read it. Mm -hmm. Also, um, the fact that, you know, when you write a book, remember that readers are creative too, you know, they, it's not right. like, oh, so film, true. So you true. know, so you must leave gaps for them to fill yeah. in and allow yeah. them to create as long as you go. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I remember one thing was that, you know, remember when you first saw your book that you loved that was turned into a film and the disappointment yeah. of it. Yes. You know, because no one, no one can live up to your imagination. And this is the imagination of readers. So I, I then I went back and started rewriting knowing very well that I'm working with a um, with a reader and that they are not passive and that I should respect yeah, that. Exactly. That's yeah. <laughs> exactly the way I feel. It's really fascinating. Okay, I'm gonna look at the chat thing and um, see what kind of questions we have. Uh, so Mary Ongwin says, Jennifer, thank you for exploring and representing, representing Uganda's rich culture. Um, as a Ugandan, I so relate to the uncles and aunties refusing to let you proceed with your story. Um, I, I'm gonna try to find a question. Uh, okay, give me two seconds, sorry. Um, Oh, why does the novel have two different titles? I didn't notice that. I just have one title, A Girl is a Body of Water. Um, yes, it's, um, it's a publishing thing, that. So I, I, the book was called First Woman. Mm. Yes, because of Chintu, the first man. Yes, yes, yes. But when it came to America, that title did not work because in America, there's always the first woman to go to the moon, the first woman to do this, the first So it would not resonate with the first woman on earth as an Adamic figure. So um, the publishers w wanted another, a different title. So we, we played around with more titles and they had this. In fact, the short stories too, uh, in, in Britain they called Manchester Happened. The Americans wouldn't have Manchester Happened because that is so specific to mm. Britain. Even though there's a Manchester in, in America. I grew up in a Manchester. Can, can you imagine? 
but it's still uh, we changed it to let's tell the story properly because that's one of the stories in there. Yeah. So it, it's it's a publishing thing and it's about America and the way it perceives the whole idea of the first woman. Because mm. uh, the first woman, it just comes apparently Ginsburg. I see, I see. Yeah. Um, okay, we have um, Tome who's saying, hi, Jennifer, I loved Kintu. You were one of the finalists for the Prix de Af des Afriques um, for la Scène Littéraire here in Switzerland. I hope you win and come visit us and pick up your award. Oh, um, I don't, I didn't even know that. <laughs> I don't know. I've been shortlisted somewhere, thank you. That's so exciting. So that's the first of many, I know. Um, and so uh, one person says, I love how feminism and patriarchy is portrayed and carried throughout this book. So active, not cloaked in wokeness. And then um, another person, I love your character of Auntie Abby and the advice she gave to Chirobo regarding taking care of herself first, the importance of owning her property. I loved, I loved Auntie Abby too, so much. She's such a great character. And I love that moment at the end that I won't, ru when I won't ru ruin, but her grandmother sets her straight about, you know, how <laughs> Abby has always been there for her. And I yes. that was a really powerful moment. Um, uh, let me just see if there's another question. There's a reason, Jasmine. There is a recent precedent by Professor um, Simbambi, whose daughter became heir. Things may be starting to change, although oh. it could have class implications. Um, oh yeah, Professor Simbambi, that is interesting. Yeah. Um, I am all the way in Johannesburg, South Africa, and identified with Chirobo so much. Chirobo's granny was who my granny was. So many similarities, and I just wanted to thank you for seeing us girls from town, the townships and villages. It's lovely. Um, sorry, I'm just I'm just seeing if there are questions. There's so many wonderful comments. You're gonna have to read all of them because they go. They're just wonderful. So many thank yous and um, all of that. Uh, is this book in any way connected to Kintu or Chintu? Um, in the beginning, I wanted the, t I desperately wanted these two books to be connected. I wanted Chintu to be about the first man and Chirabo to be about the first woman. And in a way, um, I wanted the myth, you know, our Adamic or originary myth to work like that. But when it came, it came to this book, I, I could not find a character in among those four women to carry the first woman the way Chinto carried the first man in the book. Mm -hmm. But also because uh, the first woman is a very um, prob problematic figure because just like Eve, she carries this feminine guilt. Um, mm -hmm. She, uh, Eve, um, tempted Adam to break the rules. Right. But in, in my culture, um, Nambi was the sister of death. So um, I, I had problems as a feminist, but also writing a feminist novel, dealing with that and making a woman carry uh, the weight of being the first woman, but also being the sister of death. It, it, it just failed and I tried to twist Chirabo into place to carry that, but she couldn't. And, but in the end, what I did was to make her stepmother, Nambi. Right, right. Um, and, 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 and bring out that element of, of feminine guilt, mm -hmm. okay? Because culturally in Buganda, we are all grandchildren of Nambi. We worship how you know we, we, but there's something that we always forget that she's the mother of the nation she's this and she's that and she brought all life on life uh, on on earth but she also brought death but that is never mentioned culturally um mm -hmm. or when we meet as baganda or when we tell our stories we always forget that and for me 
that's where my anger was. And I thought, okay, I'm not going to allow you to forget what you said about the woman. So uh, the woman who's called Nambi mm -hmm. uh, is accused of bringing death mm -hmm. into the family. Mm -hmm. So interesting because just the fact that you, you were trying to go somewhere and make, and, and kind of, um, uh, you know, you had this certain idea and it didn't work. It's the good writer who figures it out, you know, who said, who doesn't force it, you know, you try and you try and if it doesn't work, you have to go somewhere else. You know, you have to make it work in some other way. And oh, that, uh, absolutely. Um, Shirawa didn't turn out the way I had planned her. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you well, know, she's, yeah, I had to I mean, let go. She's better and amazing. You know, she's just an incredible character. Um, okay, now we have um, uh, I will read the book and re listen to this discussion. There's so many app phrases that you use, even in just your conversation, that help me give. Sorry, that help give me a language for what I need to say to myself and others, i.e. I will not cur curtail my life. How did you come by the language you needed to advocate for yourself, for your characters? Uh, now that, that's a difficult one. Um, perhaps it's because I, when I'm writing, when I'm thinking, when I'm telling the story, I tend to use, to think in my first language. And, um, and, but then I write in English. There's a way that having both this, these languages is very useful to an author. Because when Luganda lets me down, then I quickly turn to English. Mm -hmm. uh, and when English lets me down, then I go to Luganda, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are moments when Luganda is a, as, is a very gentle, very soothing language. Mm -hmm. Then I use that. Mm -hmm. uh, there are times when, Engl when Luganda is harsh to a woman. Mm -hmm. And then I turn to English. Mm -hmm. And, and we do this all the time uh, in Uganda. So, for example, um, when a woman speaks to uh, anybody of an older generation, we have to kneel down. But it's very easy to switch to English and say, hello, how are you? And then you don't have to kneel down. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Oh, that's, that, that, that's, that's the kind of switching. That, or yeah. when I want to be firm, there's a way my language may not allow me to be firm with somebody or my parents or someone older than me because it will be very rude. That's when I switch to English and I say, mom, listen. Right. I can't say that in Luganda. Okay. I can't say that to my mother in right. Luganda. So how do I find that language? It's those two languages working in tandem, me jumping out and moving out and stepping out into the other and finding the, the gentler parts of those two languages. So interesting. Maya, are you going to allow me to ask one more question or no? One more question. So um, this is from Abiola Johnson. Um, what advice do you have for aspiring writers who are writing the African narrative and having difficulty breaking into the publishing industry? How were you able to handle all your rejections? Excellent question. Yes, that, that is a very difficult. Looking back now, 20 years later, um, it's very hard to tell. I, I would like to say that I uh, just persevered, be strong, but hey, I cried. You know, there were moments when I wanted to give up. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I had this stubborn hope, this stubborn belief that I had something to say and that I needed to say it and that the world needed to hear it. It, it's it's that it's, it, it borders with arrogancy <laughs> <laughs> but um, you you but as an author you need that yeah. you keep it to yourself but you need to be strong and say yes 
my name is Abiola and I have something to say and the world will listen and I'll keep on changing it and changing it until it comes into a language that they will accept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. I think the stubbornness is, is so, is so right on, you know, it's just a, a stubborn, I, I feel like in my case, I just wasn't good at anything else. And so I had to be stubborn and stick with it because I had no other options, you know? <laughs> yes. Not having options is a good thing as well. Cause <laughs> yeah. I, I, when I left Uganda, I had sold everything I had and I put all the money into this course. And when it didn't work, I didn't have anywhere else to go. Yeah. I needed to get this right. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, thank you so much. I think, I think we have to stop because it's 5.02. Um, thank you for, uh, to host, for hosting me, Lily. So fun. You're such a generous reader and I've enjoyed talking to you. I and thank you to so everyone out there who've uh, logged in today to listen to me. I hope to meet you somewhere else in future. And thank you, Bashan, for hosting us. Well, no problem. Thank you. This was a wonderful discussion and thank you everyone who's tuned in, uh, participate uh, yet again. Well, not for long, but the, the link to the book is in the chat. You can purchase a copy and oh, I'm sorry. One last question. Uh, Jennifer, is there anything you're currently reading? Yes, I'm reading uh, Marlon James's um, uh, Black Leopard, Red Wolf. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm reading it very slowly because it's the kind of book that you can't rush over, but I'm enjoying it uh, because it, it's told in a very African way. You know, we tell stories going forward, but then we, we go that way, and then we go that way, you know, like an old man, and then you go forward and then you think, mm, no, I'm going that way and then that way. <laughs> That's the way um, uh, he stored it and I'm loving every moment of it. Uh, that, that's a good one. <laughs> but once again, thank you very much for joining us for PNP Live. Thank you. Will I have access to the, um, uh, the chat? I'd like to read what... Um, oh, the, yeah. Um, that's a good question. Let's, um, let's see.